Welcome to the My Community, Our Earth uh, Global Connections and Exchange Program webinar. This morning's webinar is on youth leadership and student exchanges. And this morning we have um, our panelists will be Dr. Patricia Solis presenting along with Phil Klein and Waverly Ray who will be sharing their expertise on student exchanges this morning. And um, with that, I am going to uh, shift our um, screen over to Patricia Solis so that she can begin um, the presentation. Okay, Patricia, um, the screen should have shifted over to your computer. We can see you now. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. This is the fifth webinar that we've been doing under the program. And uh, while I realize that it might be the first one for some of you, we welcome those of you back who are joining us again. And uh, also, would uh, like to give a warm welcome to those of you who are joining us for the first time. Today, we're going to talk about youth leadership and exchanges and a little bit about um, why youth-led projects might help with some learning goals, which is the whole structure of the program, and how to logistically do some of the exchanges, which is what you've been waiting for, as well as talk about what makes for some successful exchange. I first want to just show you the faces and the names of our project team. Um, I'm Patricia Solis, and uh, you've also heard from Susan Gallagher Heffron. She's uh, been leading the webinars in the past. Um, there's a lot of other people behind the scenes. I want to acknowledge uh, Jean McKendry, who's in Washington, D.C., Astrid NG, who is also here in Panama with me, Greg Osborne, and Michael Solom on our team there in the office in, in D.C. And so uh, just so you can see our faces as well and, and get to know us a little bit better. Um, the purpose of the whole MICO program just to orient you, if you uh, haven't uh, reviewed this, is to engage youth in using geography to see how their community, communities can be more sustainable. And we do this in a way that will help foster leadership by the youth to take on this uh, role of trying to understand how they can make a difference in their own communities through geography and, and uh, take being stewards of their communities. So you can see that the theme of leadership is very integral to the whole My Community, Our Earth program. It is also integral to this particular um, project that is funded by the State Department, the Global Connections and Exchange Program, which has the a very similar purpose of trying to empower youth to tackle these uh, important issues, including for sustainability and engage and educate um, through the exchange of information around the world. So there's a strong affinity here, and that connection is, is made stronger by this focus on leadership and exchange. So what is it that we want to see through this project together? Um, the results that we are trying to achieve are um, successful online international learning exchanges, and uh, those will be uh, explained in more detail what we mean by those ex exchanges in just a moment. And we also want to see projects developed by the classrooms that are hopefully led by youth in conjunction with you all as teachers around these sustainable development themes that we've been talking about for the last several months. Um, so what are these themes? Uh, obviously geography and GIS and geographic technologies as well as climate change, green economy, food security, vulnerability, and hazards, which we've had webinars on. And this time we're going to talk about these uh, last two themes, youth leadership and having successful international online exchanges. Just to give you a little bit of a definition, a working definition of what we mean by youth leadership when we say this, it really is a multifaceted concept, and it, it's understood and practiced very differently in different places and countries, although there are some things that we have in common. Uh, one of the things that we want to emphasize is um, that leadership, giving youth 
the chance to be leaders in these projects and leaders of their own learning can provide many opportunities as well as challenges. Um, good leaders make decisions and effective decision making is based on information and knowledge and leaders take responsibility, they take action. This is done in ethical ways and especially when we're talking about online exchanges it implies a ethic of uh, digital citizenship which we'll show you some resources on in a moment. Leaders also build relationships and they mobilize communities and uh, this exchange program is definitely about relationships. So let me take you to our website where we've compiled some resources for you to look at and use in your classroom. It's aag.org slash GCE leadership. If you can see my screen now, this is what it looks like. This is a, a, the familiar uh, website that you've seen some of the other themes around. Um, and this time we uh, include the definition about making decisions, taking responsibility, and mobilizing communities. I want to point out that we have uh, identified how these align with national standards for youth development and leadership. And something interesting in, in these set of resources that uh, we'd, we'd like for you to take a look at is how we've linked them to some past projects by MICO students over the past decade of activity. For example, uh, this one is about food security in Uganda. And it demonstrates how leaders sometimes have to make decisions and how this student uh, used geography and GIS to sort of help that process of decision making and decision support system. Um, leaders taking action. We have other examples. There's a nice video here about a group of girls in a school in Jamaica. Um, but you can learn more about how uh, they did this with the green economy and uh, inspired action in their own communities. Um, and we have a couple of uh, examples on leadership and community building. One is from Honduras about climate change and another one from Texas about vulnerability and hazards. So you can read more about these and you can, you can see what are some inspiring examples and it also at the same time helps you think about what uh, you might want to do with your own classrooms. Some additional re uh, bibliography and resources of leadership at the bottom of the page. So with that, before we move on, I think we have a poll that we wanted to uh, ask you about. And if Susan would introduce the question. Um, yes, I have it ready here. And what the poll is going to ask is, have you conducted international student exchanges? And we're just trying to get a sense of um, perhaps who has, um, has tried this with their students or maybe you've been a participant. Um, right now it looks like about only 11% have, 10% have tried this before and 90% are saying no, that they haven't done student exchanges before. So um, great, that's helpful for us so that we can um, support you and provide additional um, information as the projects move along during the spring semester here. Um, How exciting. Yeah, all right. So I'm going to go ahead and close the poll now. It'll come back to you, Patricia. Thank you. You'll hear from our other panelists here in a moment about what makes for a successful exchange and they'll give us some really good advice. They've been doing this for many years and um, I'll just introduce to you a little bit about the nuts and bolts of how we're setting up a framework for you to be able to do this. When we're talking about exchanges through this program, as you know, they're virtual exchanges. We're not really having anybody travel uh, from one place to another, but with the miracles of the internet and and online connections, it, it, uh, it's uh, very exciting uh, and almost like being there sometimes. So we're trying to set up a way that these exchanges can really uh, make some of the learning ideas in your classroom come alive. So these can be exchanges of all sorts. We're talking about teacher to teacher, uh, classroom to classroom. They can be exchanges that are one-on-one -on -one or many to many. 
Uh, sometimes you can do them in real time if we can set up uh, the uh, situation where the time zones uh, can be conquered. Or whenever you happen to be online, you can do it asynchronously and exchange and leave messages for each other through these systems that we have set up for you. Um, throughout all of these exchanges, I want you to be mindful that these discussions and the collaborations that you're exchanging around have a learning purpose. And this can vary by depending on the exchange, but it's important to keep in mind and ask yourself, what is the purpose of this exchange at this point in time so that um, it can be directed and be useful for everybody involved. Sometimes that might mean you want to share um, some learning strategies or methodologies or answer questions about some of the GIS uh, or some of the um, knowledge on the themes and exchange and deepen your understanding of those things. Maybe it's simply just to connect with other people in, in other places and learn a little bit about geography uh, and, and use this opportunity to learn about these uh, partners. Um, or it could be even to organize yourself or organize with each other uh, some ideas for youth projects that could be conducted together, either getting or giving feedback on those. Um, throughout all of this, uh, there is an ethic and um, sort of a digital citizenship. And I just want to show you that we do have online um, here some uh, discussion about digital citizenship and why it's important. So you can find this on our website here. GECE Digital Citizen, and you can uh, go through this with your students and make sure that they understand some of the ethical considerations on behavior online, such as netiquette, being polite, and not offering offensive language, and, and, uh, and so on. Um, we do have this, web, uh, this uh, email address set up for you to report any abuses to Michael at aag.org. We would like to know about anything if you have, if you have any concerns. Uh, any concerns that, uh, that we should know about ahead of time, sooner rather than later. Okay? So, uh, just to remind you who we are, these are the participating sites. It's a map of, of uh, all of the sites, actually spanning a lot of time zones. Uh, and here is a list. We also have this list and the names of all of the coordinators on the website, so you can find each other uh, easily uh, in the, uh, the coordinators of each of these sites. And uh, in the knowledge community, you can also find each other, and I'll show you that here in a moment. Um, we've been talking about many different ways that you can exchange and connect, and we've set up a suite of resources for you. We've been doing the webinars uh, and some of these other things already, uh, but today I want to talk about these two that are highlighted in orange, the AAG knowledge communities, and those are when you would like to um, exchange with other teachers and coordinators offline, not in real time. You can leave messages and discussions uh, for mentoring and logistics, or you could post messages on, on behalf of your classrooms in that, in that system, too. Uh, we also uh, will be offering synchronous exchanges uh, where you can do live chat or live video conferencing um, in real time. We can have up to six sites together, and uh, we'll show you how you can schedule that. At the bottom, I have the e-learning platforms with the optional Moodle accounts by request, and uh, Phil and Waverly can tell you a little bit about that uh, in, for those of you who are interested in using a more heavy-duty kind of system. This is just a screenshot of the knowledge communities, and I'll take you there in a moment. And this is what it looks like when you do some of the live video conferencing. This was a meeting that we had with all of our coordinators. You can see how exciting this might be for some of your students if they can see the other kids in the classrooms through this live uh, video um, when you want to schedule that. Okay, so how do you get to all of this? Here is the website to get there, GCE Social Net. And I'll go there now so I can show you how to log in. Here's the URL. At the top of the page, this is the AAG uh, uh, system. So at the top of the page, you see this uh, login box here. You just go ahead and enter your username and password and click login. This was given to you by email already, uh, so you should have it. And if you don't, please send us an email at to michael at aag.org, and we'll resend that to you. Some of you have been able to log in, so we're happy that you've been able to do that. You should see your name. Welcome back. 
And on this very same page, just navigate down to where you see the Colorful Myco logo and click on the link to the discussions and posting. And that will take you right into our home page for the Myco Global Connections and Exchange Program. Let me get a little closer so you can see it better. You should see your name at the top. The first thing that you might check is going to this tab called My Profile and take a look at your profile. Here's where you can post information about yourself or about your classroom and we encourage you to, to definitely do that. If you have a picture um, of yourself or of your classroom, you could uh, edit your picture right here. Click on this and just upload your photographs or the photograph you wish to uh, represent your classroom. And you can see uh, all of the contact information that we have for you and edit that yourself. Uh, there is for you to do this. You just click on it and a little system comes up and lets you type in just as easy if you were typing your description and save. So you can see who else are members of this uh, community if you go up to this tab here called members. That's where you will also show up. You can see we have 146 members in this community. So it's pretty exciting that there should be a lot of opportunity to connect with each other. We should find uh, someone with some interests in common here. Um, not very many people have um, uploaded uh, photographs yet, but when they do, you can see this. And you can find them. For example, here's Astrid. You just click on their name, and their profile will come up so you can read all about them and see their smiling faces. So we encourage you to go ahead and do this so we can get to know each other and uh, that might be a good place to start. So after you check that out, um, you might want to send a message to a particular member. If you want to send it to an individual, you can just go here to their profile and click on the link that says send message. And this will be just an individual message where you can type in the subject line here and type your message right here. It works just like a direct email, they will get it in their email inbox and you can get the reply in your email inbox and hit send. If you would like to send a message to the whole group, come up here to discussions and you can see all of the different discussion threads that we've already posted. You can see that a few people have uh, logged in already and uh, you can then click on the subject thread. Let's look at this one from Michael. Thanks, Michael, for posting. Susan um, sent a message and Michael replied. And if you want to add to this discussion, you just say reply to discussion. And it's, it's fairly simple. You see the uh, blank page here that you can type your message right here. Type your message and hit send and it goes to the whole discussion. Here's the send button at the bottom left corner. Okay. Uh, so that's how that works and we encourage you to go ahead and use those and, and start posting messages and getting to know each other. This is for the exchanges that can happen offline just whenever you're available. You can do it at night at home or you can do it within your classroom. You can post on behalf of your students if you like. Now um, when you want to set up an exchange for real-time, live, synchronous exchanges. We've set up this space called Exchange Space here where you can see uh, that there's an ability to uh, check when people are wanting to schedule their exchanges. Um, there are no requests yet, but here's a spreadsheet where you will also be able to see what theme, what proposed date, what time, what country, city, what school, what format, if they want to do it with video or chat, and anything else you want to add here. When you want to add a request, just click on this that says add your own request here, and you'll be taken to this form so that, that you can click on a topic or a theme. Let's say you want to talk about the green economy, and you're available on January 18, 2012, 
we're already using 2012. And we're here at any time uh, from 8 to, to noon in the morning. Um, we have a link to time zones here if you need to check on when time zones might be possible. Put in your own country, um, state or country here, your city, the name of your school so we can find you, and your last name because there are sometimes teachers that are uh, more than one teacher for, from each school. Here you can choose if you want to do a video or a chat or no preference. Anything else you would like to know, you can add in the notes right here and hit submit. Now this will be immediately available for uh, anyone to see. You get a confirmation that your response has been recorded and you can go back to the spreadsheet and already see that um, people can find your uh, suggested time in real time right away. Now when we've confirmed an exchange, you can let us know that maybe you've uh, set this together offline. So you can type, click on the link to the side that says confirm an exchange. And you can put your contact information in here. Oops, still misspelling my own name. What date? We did find the date, but it was on the 17th instead. And we're going to do it at 9 a.m. And then put your email address in here. And then submit that to us so we can make sure and put it on, on the calendar. We will confirm these through moderation, or you can confirm them to us. You can also alternatively look at this calendar of schedule exchanges once we get some of them going, so that you might be able to find some that are already confirmed and in progress. And you can uh, request to be added to that exchange if it, can, if it works out with you. So we have some other links here to remind you about some of the um, ideas and learning themes and uh, some, some helpful hints, but that's basically it in a nutshell on how you can uh, use this space to get connected with each other. So with that, I'd like to go uh, back to the PowerPoint here and uh, welcome a couple of special panelists who are going to talk about how we do this successfully. And we're really excited to, to learn from their experience and, and have them help us uh, uh, ask questions and discuss how to do this successfully. Okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, change presenters now. We'll be going to Phil. And there will just be a moment here while we change. Um, you should have the screen coming up, Phil. Yep, we can see your we can see your screen. Okay, cool. Well, I'm going to say good afternoon, everybody, because I'm speaking to you from uh, Colorado. Um, we've been asked uh, Waverly and I've been asked to present a little bit about from our own experiences of conducting uh, international student exchanges this, uh, uh, as part of this webinar. We've both been involved in a project known as the Center for Ge uh, Global Geography Education, or CGGE for short, which is uh, an AAG project. Um, the website for it is, is listed there. I believe you've been introduced to this resource before. It's a set of uh, modules containing um, resources for teaching uh, to, it's aimed at college students, but it, uh, it can also be used by advanced uh, high school students as well, secondary students. Um, the topics of the, uh, of, of the project include global climate change, global economy, migration, national identity, population and natural resources, and water resources. And several of these uh, topics are, are quite appropriate for the, uh, the projects that you're all working on. Each module consists of a conceptual framework, which is about um, uh, 15 or so pages, web pages or so typically, that provides um, some conceptual background uh, on the topic uh, as, as uh, discussed by geographers. And then a series of case studies that are, uh, uh, show how the, each individual issue uh, plays out in different parts of the world. When you go to this website and you see this welcome page here, and then you would uh, 
if you were, wanted to see the content of any of these modules, you just click on the module box there on the left, whichever one you're interested in, and then the one we have a sample screenshot of is from the Population and Natural Resources module. That is um, uh, then what one does is clicks on this box here to get to the conceptual framework, and then any of the boxes down below there uh, to go to the case studies. We presently have four case studies uh, for each of the six modules and are, we'll be developing a fifth case study a little bit later this year for each of the modules. Uh, all of the modules are available in Spanish um, and you can get to those by clicking on the Espanol link there. A few of them are also available in Chinese but not all. Um, with respect to the project that you all are involved in, um, we've uh, identified several of the uh, modules and case studies that uh, are directly related to those topics. There is an entire module on the climate change issue with four case studies uh, appropriate for uh, looking at these issues. And then um, a couple of the case studies in population and natural resources and in the water resources module tie into your theme on food security, vulnerability, and, and hazards. And the theme of green economy is discussed kind of throughout uh, the modules on global economy and population and natural resources. I should also mention that each of the case studies comes with a uh, what we call collaborative projects which are designed to promote these international collaborative exchanges between students in different places that provide um, activities and uh, sometimes discussion questions about these issues that uh, ask students uh, to communicate with each other, share data, share their experiences with these issues in their own locale. And so the case studies more or less provide an entry point for understanding the issues, but then the collaborative projects allow students to uh, represent and discuss those issues on a more personal, from their own personal experiences and allowing them to compare and contrast with some of the uh, discussions presented on the, in the online modules. The collaborative projects are uh, what Patricia alluded to is available on that Moodle e-learning platform and um, we can talk a little bit more about that if you, if you would like. Um, we, both Waverly and I have, have been using these kinds of uh, international student exchanges with our college students for a number of years and one of the things that we want to communicate um, today is this idea that the, we encourage the teachers in these exchanges to really have the role of a facilitator, helping the students to maneuver through the process, but really not leading the exchange directly. It really, it's, it's really a student-led uh, project, and so this, the teacher is there to help guide, help uh, provide connections. Uh, for the students, but really to these exchanges work best when it is a student-led and student-directed project. And so that fits in very neatly with one of the learning benefits uh, of the GC, uh, of the MICO projects with the, uh, that's trying to promote student leadership. Um, I think both Waverly and I, when we were, when we were talking about this, we, we agreed that the benefits um, to the teacher, to the, to the, whether it's a university professor like myself or any teacher, are really quite dramatic and there's a number of intangibles that uh, help us to become better teachers by working in this uh, facilitator role, working collaboratively with a partner overseas, um, learning uh, about online pedagogy, but also building that connection of overseas networks, giving our own, getting our own experiences um, uh, learning about differences in educational systems, learning about different geographical issues in other places. That helps inform our own teaching in a number of other ways. So we really have found these to be a very beneficial um, project for our own learning. From the student learning benefits, um, we really uh, believe that this helps students uh, not only learn geographic content from this kind of approach, but also to really it gives them an opportunity to engage in international communication and intercultural communication and to develop their, their really their, their global citizenship and participatory skills 
by being involved in this, as well as simply learning about the issues uh, as seen by their peers in other parts of the world. What we would like to do now is just kind of go through about 10 or so different tips uh, for success at uh, different stages of the process of an exchange. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the suggestions that we have for uh, planning the exchange. Uh, Patricia's already told you about the, uh, the system that you have available to you for, for uh, finding a partner. And then Waverly will uh, lead through some discussion about uh, some of the, uh, the tips for ensuring a successful exchange uh, during the process of the exchange itself. So before the exchange, um, the really important point is to have a good solid plan. Um, the modules that we have on the CGGE website are um, designed to be uh, sort of where you, uh, uh, users can pick and choose. Uh, they might want to have use uh, the conceptual framework. They might want to use one or two or more of the case studies. They may want to use one or two of the collaborative projects. And so it's important to sort of come to an agreement beforehand of what the, uh, in the time available that you might have for an exchange, um, what elements you would want to include that are going to be most beneficial. That being said, the schedule should be treated only as a structure um, and not slavishly adhered to because one of the hallmarks of a successful exchange is, is really flexibility and being able to, uh, being willing to uh, take longer on some things or shorter on some things depending on how things go. So, but to have a good timetable of activities, who's going to do what, when, uh, try to lay that out at the beginning uh, so you at least have some guidelines. Next, prior to uh, beginning, you want to make sure that you know what it is that you're going to be asking your students to do and uh, explaining how they will be marked on this process if this is indeed going to be a graded assignment in, in your classes. Uh, one of the issues that you will want to determine is whether or not you and your uh, international exchange partners uh, the other teachers will want to use a common assessment or if you will be going to uh, targeting, for example, a, uh, a student project that will be collaboratively produced in different, um, different sites uh, and that students then know exactly what is expected of them. Um, and there's advantages uh, to the idea of common assessments and also some disadvantages. And we're happy to take some questions at the end. Um, if people are, uh, would like some more discussion about that. The other point to make before the exchange is to make sure the students know why they're doing it. Um, the learning outcomes of the, in terms of the content uh, that are uh, explored in the CGGE modules are provided on the website. But in addition to just content learning outcomes, it's important that students understand that um, there are some uh, outcomes that are expected in terms of gaining international uh, communications and intercultural communications competence, in terms of learning how to uh, engage uh, politely and um, productively with folks in other places uh, through internet. Um, which is, of course, a method of communication that is going to be widely employed in their, in their future uh, and working with other folks so that in other cultures. So having that familiarity, getting that familiarity, and helping students understand that what they're doing isn't just about content, but it's also about some of these leadership and other sort of intangible outcomes that Patricia was discussing uh, earlier this afternoon. And it's always important um, through these uh, these exchanges, especially if you're using materials like the online materials available through the AAG Center for Global Geography Education, to, to keep those concepts connected um, to what uh, your course is about and ultimately the projects that you're trying to help students get to so that they see that there's sort of a, a seamless connection between what they're being asked to do in this exchange and, and their own projects. With that, I'm going to let Waverly uh, take uh, the next series of um, 
success, success tips. Okay, Phil, can you advance to the next slide? Oh, here we are. Okay. So, uh, thank you, Phil. Um, so, starting the exchange, so once you've um, gotten your timeline and you've communicated the learning goals for the students, it's important that the students complete an icebreaker activity. In the online environment, it's really important so that students um, have this, what they call, online presence and familiarity, uh, basically that they feel comfortable as a unique person interacting online, and also gets students used to using Moodle. And the icebreaker activity could also be adapted uh, where the students aren't directly online, but it's really important that students start to get to know each other in an informal situation because a lot of the issues that students will talk about, um, or some of them, could be contentious. And so it's important that they feel comfortable sort of um, engaging in important dialogue. And the next uh, element at the beginning of the exchange, and this really builds on you know, sort of the ideas of digital citizenship and student leadership, is to have students draft international team charters. And this uh, allows students to set the expectations for their level of work and how, how they will interact with their peers in another country. And the tendency for teachers and educators is to sometimes limit the icebreaker activity and the team charter. But really, these are two really critical uh, components that you want to make sure you have time in at the beginning of the exchange. Um, so I would not recommend skipping these because it really um, uh, will have a big impact on the success of the, chain, of, of the exchange in the long run. OK, the next slide, please. And so during the exchange, it's really important that the facilitators uh, model having an international perspective. And so that means being open, flexible, patient, and reflective. So we can sort of think about the skills that you have as, as a person uh, with uh, international experience, you know, what kind of skills you've had for intercultural communications, and think about what kind of skills you would want your students to have, and then maybe model that for them um, throughout the process. And then for number seven, uh, being aware of issues related to the differences in both educational systems and languages. And these can be used as a teachable moment for students. So some of the words that we might use in the United States will differ in different countries. Uh, and so just being clear on, on the, the meanings, idioms are always an interesting thing uh, when it runs through translation. And so those can be teachable moments uh, where students can start to understand that you know, the perspective that they've uh, grown up on might not be the perspective um, for other people across the planet. Um, and number eight, also during the exchange, it's really important to provide ongoing guidance to students. Um, so this isn't sort of a hands-off uh, type of pedagogy, but it's important that you can monitor student group activity and guide student work. And it's also important if you have students in groups that if one group is excelling at one particular dialogue or project, to really share and, and, and let the whole class understand what's been successful with that so the students can learn from each other. Uh, it's important also to perhaps refocus students if they've gotten off focus um, so that they can really uh, reach those learning outcomes that you've initially communicated to them. And then also, for especially, especially for online exchanges, um, having class time to address logistics and student concerns. So this is sort of a, a time separate from w when you're having the students learn, but having students uh, be able to express any issues or, or questions that they have that relate to those logistics that come up uh, during the exchange. Um, for number nine, maintaining collaboration momentum. Depending on the length of the exchange, this will become more or less important. Uh, you want to remain in contact with your international partner. If things come up, uh, you might want to reschedule, or if students uh, want to focus on uh, a particular issue in, in more detail, then you would want to communicate that with your international partner. You might want to set up you know, weekly chats, um, if that's available, or, or just stay in contact by emails. Um, and you can also adjust the timetable of activities um, to maximize student interest and understanding. Um, another thing you could also do if there's something lagging, um, you could perhaps exchange a photograph or, or, or keep something um, interesting for students so that they feel like if uh, their work, so they're getting bogged down in their work, that it's something that they can, um, you know, really gr grasp something intercultural immediately that could be something that's low stakes. 
um, that students will, will keep their interest in. And then number 10, it's also important in, in this idea of uh, the teacher as facilitator and, and the students as um, the leaders and the creators of their own learning is to have students um, write reflective essays or, or given self-assessments. Um, so this allows them to think about what they've learned in this international um, exchange experience. And then also this will, will provide the educators with meaningful feedback that can be implemented in future international exchanges. And so this will help you as you build um, on what Phil was saying, this will build on your own uh, professional development um, as you uh, or continue, hopefully, to uh, conduct these international exchanges in the future. And then with that, I'll turn it back to Phil, and he'll talk um, about some questions for discussion. OK, thank you, Waverly. Um, really, we just wanted to leave it open for the participants in the webinar. We have four potential questions there that might uh, uh, that occur to us as always kinds of questions that are uh, are worth talking about. But if there's anything that uh, you were, would like us to talk a little bit more about, um, I think uh, you submit a question and then Susan will let us know what um, what kinds of issues are on your mind. Um, yeah, you have a question box over um, on your webinar panel, and so if you do have any questions for Waverly or Phil, you can submit those um, to us, and we'll also um, have a little more information from Patricia, and again, we'll have time at the end of the webinar also to talk and discuss these, but does anyone have any questions at this point? We have one question. Um, Michael is asking, where do we find in our international collaborators? Should we just choose from the collaborating partners of the MICO project? And I think um, uh, Patricia might uh, address that question. Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. I think that if I understood the question correctly, it is, where can you find the collaborators? And I would encourage you to. Um, think about one of two ways to do that. One would be to go on, log on to the knowledge communities and uh, look through the membership and you can view some of the profiles of the people who are in the um, system. There's 146 teachers that we have registered. The uh, complicated thing about that right now is that not everybody has updated their profile, so as that's happening, a Another way to do that would be to also look at the participating sites on the website, and the GCE website. You can, see, you can see who are the participating sites, and you see the names of the coordinators. And if you have interest in perhaps a, perhaps a particular region, or you have interest in a particular theme, um, I, I would just encourage you to uh, either let them know directly or let us know or uh, post it on the knowledge communities where we will start these conversations and, and start building the sort of interest groups around different themes and, and different places. So um, just consider it as sort of a framework to be able to try to um, uh, connect it with um, teachers maybe at a, di at a different level. You'll start to see uh, some are teaching um, lower level grades, perhaps, and some are teaching upper secondary level grades. And so those kinds of information are really important when you put it on your bio descriptor. And, and whenever in doubt, if you are looking for a certain uh, type of exchange, just please send us an email at, uh, to myco at aag.org, and we'll just help you get oriented.
Okay, I think we'll continue on right now, and then um, at the end of the webinar, we'll uh, respond to any additional questions that you might have. So I'm going to go ahead and change the uh, screen back to Patricia. So Patricia, you should be seeing this shift back to you. Yes, I do. Do you see my screen? Um, we see your screen now. Um, I just wanted to return to this idea about expectations as we're um, sort of looking to, to, to think about how we're going to use all of these resources and this framework um, in different classrooms. And um, I wanted to go back to this slide that I talked about expected results. This is expected results from the program, although I'm sure you have certain expectations that we hope that in the design of the program, um, some learning expectations and uh, experience that, that you're and you will be able to get from it. Um, what we really do hope to happen is have on successful online international learning exchanges that do feature geography, and uh, we hope to have the participation of all of the classrooms in all of these countries. Um, and I know we will be able to do that at, at one level or another. Some will be more active than others, and um, it'll be it'll happen in, in many different ways in the different places but hopefully we've set up a framework that is going to work for you the other results that we're looking for again are these youth-led projects on sustainable development themes and we've gone over what those themes are and um, we think they're broad enough that they will uh, serve your individual coursework in many different ways and uh, so we're not defining what those projects have to be in terms of whether they have to be individuals or small groups or the whole classroom or classroom to classroom, we would like for you to be able to decide what those projects look like and, and help facilitate what works best for your classrooms. Um, so so how, how are we going to actually uh, measure these results? That's as the, you know, the person in charge of writing all of the reports for this. I want to know the answer to this question. So um, let me tell you that we're keeping track of the hours of exchange time on the websites that we have, whether they're live or whether they're uh, just whenever you can ever respond. So um, that's something that we're looking at. And we're also um, going to be sending um, evaluations around. So please respond. Uh, we want to uh, not just measure how much time, but how was the quality of that for you. Um, you do know that there was a survey that was sent out um, for SurveyMonkey earlier. Some of you have received um, some of the reminders. And if you haven't taken that baseline survey yet, we really encourage you to go ahead and do so because this will help us as we do these metrics um, and make sure that the program is working for you. Um, the other uh, measurable outcome is basically how many projects that we have and what those projects look like and, and uh, the quality of those projects. So that's what we're going to be looking for. And I just wanted to let you know that there is a little bit of an incentive here uh, beyond the learning outcomes and, and uh, the kinds of things that you're already uh, tangibly and intangibly getting from your participation. Um, the, the My Community Our Earth program has a larger initiative right now to uh, uh, collect student projects from around the world and we have some recognition and prizes and, and uh, a system where we're going to um, select some of the uh, most outstanding projects for showcasing at the United Nations Earth Summit, the 20 year anniversary of the Earth Summit that's going to happen in Rio this summer in June. And so there is a website here, we'll make sure you, you have these this URL so you can formally turn in your project if you want to be eligible for those recognitions and, and prizes. That's not a requirement for it to count as a GCE project, but we really hope that you take that last final step. It doesn't take very much. A title, a summary, one map with a description, and one photo with a caption. So if you want to incorporate those elements as part of the project that you're creating, um, there is sort of an incentive to do so. Um, the other incentive is that after this Rio um, event in this coming summer, starting in about July, we'll issue a call for a mini grant competition, which we're calling Creative Connections. 
and we want to see what are some of the innovations that you uh, come up with through these exchanges. What would you like to do? What would you like to see? And we have some funds reserved from the State Department to try to help make that happen. Now, the more that you are familiar with the system and participate, and the more connections that you have, the more competitive, obviously, that you will be for um, this mini-grant competition, and I think the better the ideas will be. So this is sort of the design of the project, the carrot, so to speak, um, for all of your hard work um, throughout the, this, this spring. And speaking of the, the spring, let me just run through the schedule overview. We do this towards the end of each of the, pro of the webinars, just to familiarize yourself with the calendar. Um, today is this uh, webinar on um, leadership and international exchanges. And uh, we'll post this online for people who uh, could not make the time or in a time zone that uh, makes it inconvenient for them. And uh, we uh, have all of these resources ready for you to use. So we um, are starting this process now of uh, when your school is in session to use these resources, the learning resources we've been going through, and then this framework for uh, exchanges. Uh, we will have uh, in-person meetings with our coordinators. Uh, they know about this. We're purchasing tickets right now for the international uh, coordinators to meet us in New York City at the AAG annual meeting. Um, so we'll report to all of the teachers on that as well. Uh, so throughout this, uh, this period from January to May, we hope that you're, you're going to be using for teacher exchanges and classroom exchanges. And um, we'll be supporting uh, that through, through this period by offering some guided opportunities, offering some uh, moderation of the exchange uh, websites, um, doing some encouragement, sending you some information, and try to make sure that this goes smoothly for you. By March, we really hope that uh, many of you have your youth projects started, that, that maybe you've um, had some lessons, that you've done some plans, you've made some connections, and you, you're really getting into your youth projects so that uh, you can uh, submit those uh, for us to be able to showcase them in June at the Earth Summit in Rio and be eligible for those optional uh, recognition and prizes. And then the summer, again, the call for Creative Connections mini grants. So to wrap it up, before we finalize and, and let you ask some questions, I know you've been thinking about this and maybe you now have some questions, uh, you might be asking, what should I do first? Uh, I think that the best advice we can give you is to log on to that knowledge community, and there's the website right here, GC Social Net, and um, create your profile. Upload a picture, post a uh, description of yourself for your classroom, and what your interests are, and maybe start a discussion uh, message if you would like to, or reply to one of the discussion threads that's already there. So uh, that's a good way to kind of get those things started and, and plan how to use uh, the system in your in your Any questions for any of the logistical information about some of the leadership resources uh, or about any of the uh, ideas that we heard from Phil and Waverly uh, on conducting exchanges? Um, yes, we have a question, Patricia. Will having weekly chats and exchange of emails be enough as a measure of successful student exchange? Um, it, it's a measure in the sense, having weekly chats is a good measure in the sense of um, having a frequency of connection, but there's also a sort of a quality issue that we hope we've given you some advice on how to think through um, uh, how, how to get connected. And it depends a lot on what goals you have for your classroom. And uh, so I think that the frequency of the interaction really depends on um, what you are planning for the outcomes, the learning outcomes from your students and how they connect with your course. We're, of course, very happy uh, with a, as heavy use of the system as you are able to manage with your, with your time. Okay. We have another question. How large should a student group be to work on a project topic? The, I can speak just from the My Community Our Earth project. We've had projects everything from individuals to groups of, you know, a whole classroom, which is generally about 25 uh, people. So we've had, we've seen a lot of different kinds of things. 
perhaps Phil and Waverly have some recommendations on what might be an optimal size from their experiences with the GCCE modules. Do you have any comments about that? Uh, this is Waverly. Um, I think if it's a in the online learning context, I, I would recommend between four and six students, depending on their maturity. And I would also agree with Patricia. It really does depend on the um, specific project uh, and what is feasible between classes. Sometimes you have a class of 40 collaborating with a class of 20. And so you sort of have to account for, the, for that uh, as well as when you're planning the exchange. OK. And I think it is um, helpful to the teachers to remind them that um, MyCo um, wants to provide flexible options so that um, these projects can be done um, in the best way for the teachers to align them and fit them into their curriculum. So, so we're supportive of all kinds of um, collaborations, whether it would be one person doing their project and sharing and collaborating, or whether it's small groups or large groups. So there's a lot of flexibility. Again, this is where having a good description on the knowledge community can be very helpful to you. If you know a little bit about what you're looking for, I think it can uh, help other people find you or you find other people. Mm -hmm. So the more specific that you can be in that description, I think the better. Um, Patricia, could you please bring up the page where you can post your uh, interest in establishing a collaboration. I think that might help one of our questions asking about um, where do you find your collaborators. And on the GCE website, um, in the knowledge community, in the exchange space, you want to look for exchange space and you can um, enter your topic and your information about um, a student um, project, and, and this can be what from your classroom. Maybe you have um, a couple individual projects, maybe you have some student groups, but where it says live synchronous exchanges, this can also, in a way, I think, help you find someone, even if you aren't going to be synchronous. I think if you could look through this list, and, and maybe the synchronous might not be easily obtainable, but I think that this list will also help you see um, who else is looking for um, a collaboration and which topics um, that you might be able to find common ground for your students to exchange. And so, yeah, so this is, I think... Um, the spreadsheet starts to fill up. You can actually sort them. Uh, so you can see all of the ones that were from the green economy, for example, or you can see all of the... Let's say you have an interest in Ghana and Africa, and so you can see all of the uh, all of the countries. Well, we don't have one for Ghana yet, but you could you can sort it by that. Uh, so that can also help you. Uh, the other way it really is this. Um, I think that uh, once we make sure everybody can get their descriptions on, you can go to members as well. Right, and in those profiles, you could also post information in the profile. Um, we have another question. Should we ask our students to log in and create their profile? Um, that gets into um, all sorts of issues on this knowledge community about um, the uh, age groups that we're working with and permissions that we don't always have answers for. So at this stage, we've uh, set up the knowledge community for it to be teacher moderated and uh, interactive. And I think that uh, for now, we can, um, we can do this. If there's a st particular teacher who uh, has mature students and, and wants to have them uh, use individual profiles, we might find some alternative ways to do it. But I don't think it's going to be through the knowledge communities just for the reasons of the um, 
these are these are people under age 18 you have to have certain kinds of permissions so um, the other thing that I, I do want to point out to you is that we do have a Facebook page and the link from that is also on this uh, social networking resources so you can connect through our group page I know that some of your students might have uh, Facebook accounts and that might be something that it, it is a, an alternative way for them to actually get connected individual to individual without it going through all of the legal and bureaucratic things that we have to do as an organization, unfortunately. We also have Twitter for those of you who use Twitter. I'm still confused about Twitter, so I'll admit that. But we do, we do. <laughs> Astrid's very good at posting, and and uh, we have a good number of followers. So that might be another option for those of you who uh, have those have students with those accounts for them to get directly engaged with each other. The other thing is through the Uvu video chat. I showed you a screenshot of that, but that's a that's a, a nice way to get them face to face and um, talking to each other and making it a little bit more personal. I also think, too, that um, the challenge of time zones can be an opportunity um, that you can actually make it an event. And it might be something, um, I realize that there's difficulties in having students attend school uh, functions after school hours or very early in the morning. Um, I realize sometimes that can be challenging, but, but sometimes you could make it an event also. and um, on a one-time uh, uh, deal or something, make it a special thing to say, you know, um, we're uh, doing this as a special event, you know, to connect with people in another part of the world. And that's also another way to see this as a way to encourage or to make it special versus saying, oh, this is just an obstacle and, you know, we can't do this. So you might think about um, ways that you can make these um, connections, special events also for your school or your students. Okay, do we have any other questions on the student exchanges? Again, in the knowledge community, um, Patricia and Astrid especially have done so much work in populating um, the pages in the GCE site and also in the knowledge community um, to help and provide information. So, um, you know, we're happy to respond to questions and if you do uh, post questions in the knowledge community, the helpful part of that is that it shows for everyone and those can be um, stored. Um, you know, we, as I look at our uh, organizational structure here, it might even be helpful for us to start a frequently asked questions um, uh, strand so that people can post specific questions in there and we can respond to them so that you can uh, read those or see those or have them um, shared as the projects get uh, taking off now because I think most of our questions will come once people actually start organizing and getting ready for their projects. Okay, um, with that, we haven't had any additional questions come in, so I will um, wrap up the webinar for today. I'd like to thank all of our panelists, uh, Patricia Solis, Phil Klein, and Waverly Ray for joining us today. Um, this webinar will be recorded, and it will be available online. And um, we look forward to corresponding with you again and um, watching all of these projects and collaborations get started. So thank you for attending today and that will conclude uh, this webinar.